Well, thank you so much, Aunt, for uh, that welcome. And it was wonderful to be at the NAIDOC Ball in Brisbane on Saturday night to see Auntie Matilda get the uh, Female Elder of the Year. And I have to say, absolutely deserved. So another clap. Balam Ambo Nanul Nambri Yunyamara Naju Yurabang Marang. In the language of my people, the Wiradjuri, I pay respect to the Nanawal and Nambri people and honour their custodianship and care for country. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today from all points of the southern sky. I also want to acknowledge my dear friend Jed Carney, uh, Rachel Stephen Smith, Marcus Stewart, um, the wonderful Arnie Geraldine Atkinson, Professor Brian Smith, uh, and, and of, of course, Justin Mohammed, our first First Nations ambassador ever. So a huge congratulations <laughs> to Justin. But most importantly, happy NAIDOC, everyone. The theme this year is for our elders. In his landmark speech, Beyond the Morning Gate, delivered in 2000, the father of reconciliation, my dear friend, Senator Patrick Dodson, used the term unfinished business. The unfinished business of our failure to recognise Indigenous Australians in, who had coexisted on this continent for more than 65,000 years. Now, 122 years after the Australian Constitution was formed, more than 80 years since William Cooper uh, had his petition, 35 years since the Barunga Statement, 30 years since Keating's Redfern speech, 16 years since John Howard promised a referendum to recognize, for recognition, 15 years since the apology, 13 years since the expert panel on constitutional recognition, and six years, everyone, since the Uluru Statement from the heart. The question must surely be asked, how much longer to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have to wait for recognition. When will we finally resolve this unfinished business? As Pat Anderson says, let's finish the unfinished business between us all. If not now, when? We are so close. Our destination is on the horizon. We are just a few short months away from realising the promise of, Ulu, of the Uluru Statement, that historic First Nations consensus on the way forward, where 250 Indigenous leaders and elders gathered in the red dirt at Uluru to issue the Statement from the Heart. The idea of constitutional recognition through a voice is what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have asked for themselves, have asked for, not the government. Later this year, Australians, you will be asked a simple question. Do you support a change to the constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Yes or no?
Canada recognised First, First Nations people in the 1980s. In New Zealand, the Crown recognised the Māori people as far back as 1840. In 2023, it is time for Australia to recognise Indigenous Australians. The first question I want to address today is why is the voice needed? And the simple answer is because the gap isn't closing fast enough. For far too long, governments have made policies for Indigenous Australians, not with Indigenous Australians. We need a voice to change that. We need the voice because we need to work in partnership with communities. We need a voice because we need to do better. And we particularly need to do better by young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. More than half of all Indigenous Australians are under the age of 25. But our young people don't start on a level playing field. They need hope. They need opportunities for parents and elders, their parents and elders did not have. They need a voice. Consider this and please stand in these shoes. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 55 times more likely to die from rheumatic heart disease than non-Indigenous people. These deaths are completely preventable. With access to medical care, proper housing and clean running water. Indigenous young people are 24 times more likely to be locked up than their neighbours. In the words of the Uluru Statement, we are not an innately criminal people. First Nations children represent 37% of all children removed from their parents, but make up only 6% of Australia's children. This number is unacceptably high. And yet the number of Indigenous children living in out of home care is expected to double in the next six years. And this cannot because we have no love for them. Our people are more likely to have experienced homelessness than to hold an undergraduate degree. In 2020, the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people locked up in a prison cell was four times as many as those who celebrated a graduating university that year. Four times as many of our people with despair rather than hope for their future. Does this mean that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have no aspirations and dreams for the better, a better future? Of course not. This is systemic and structural disadvantage. The suicide rate of our people is almost twice the rate of our fellow Australians. All these numbers sometimes obscure the fact this is about real people, real people with families and loved ones, real people like Michael Riley. Michael grew up in poverty in Dubbo during the 1960s. He spent time on Talbraga Reserve, an overcrowded place with terrible conditions and medical, and medical, medical care was almost non-existent, like so many others who were forced to live in these poor conditions. Michael suffered from chronic infections. He got rheumatic fever, a condition which his immune system never recovered. Michael became a renowned photographer and his work was shown throughout the world. 
at the peak of his career, at the age of 44, he died of end-stage renal failure. I was very close to Michael. I visited him every day in hospital. I watched him go blind in one eye. His aboriginality condemned to an early death, a preventable death. I remember being by his bedside with his cousin Lynette when he passed. I remember the injustice of it. And it's what still motivates me to this day. It's what motivates me every day to put one front foot in front of the other, to do, do better by Indigenous Australians, to do better for future generations. And we can and must do better. Just last month, we saw new data that showed four of the 19 closing the gap targets were on track. Just four out of 19. Life expectancy, not on track. Indigenous babies born with healthy birth weights, not on track. Finishing year 12, not on track. Indigenous people engaged in job jobs and training, not on track. If we needed any more evidence that more of the same isn't good enough, then this is it. We have to do things better. And I honestly believe the voice can help. We have everything to gain and nothing to lose by supporting the voice. Because the voice will be a mechanism for government and the parliament to listen. It will be like a resource of local knowledge and solutions that can help make us better and help make better policies. The great leader of the Gummich clan of northeastern Arnhem Land, the Lake Unipingu once said, they do not listen because they do not have to. It was the truth. Governments don't have to listen, whether it be local, state or federal governments. My predecessor, Ken White, put it well, re reflecting on his time as a minister when he said, one, on key areas of health and education, I saw no reflection of Aboriginal input in the, into the discussions that led to legislation being put to the parliament and the party room. The voice is about advice. Since 1967, when the Commonwealth gained powers to make, to make laws for Aboriginal people, governments have tried to develop some sort of consultative mechanism, and many haven't worked. The second question I want to answer today is how will the voice work? First, let's be clear about what the voice is, how it will help to deliver a better future and do better than past bodies. The voice will be independent, representative advisory body, made up of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The voice will be nimble, efficient and focused on making a practical difference. That is what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have asked for, to be heard. It will be chosen by local communities for local communities. The voice will give independent advice to parliament and the government on issues affecting Indigenous people and communities. This will lead to better outcomes because we know that listening to people from the grassroots levels lead to better outcomes. The voice will provide independent advice for better decisions. It will empower local voices. Every state, territory, the Torres Strait Islands and remote communities will be represented. It will be gender balanced and include the views of young people. It will consult with local communities. 
it will be accountable and transparent and it will cooperate with existing organisations. One question I'm some, sometimes asked is, why does the voice need to be in the Constitution? Why can't it just be legislated? Well, there are two main reasons, everyone. Firstly, a voice or representative body cannot be truly independent or give frank advice to, to the government of the day if the government of the day can abolish it with the stroke of a pen, and we've seen that. And secondly, it's what First Peoples requested in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. The starting point for reconciliation has to be listening to the wishes of Indigenous people. The starting point cannot be a political fix made in Canberra. That's not real reconciliation. Let me give you three examples of how the voice will work in a practical way. Practical, practical, practical. Let's say a local community identifies a problem like, like, like low school attendance. The community identified identifies that, that's the, that this is a challenge, challenge and wants to explore local solutions to improve school attendance. So the community approaches their representative on The Voice and raises this issue, this issue with them. The Voice then has the power to make representations on how to improve school attendance at the local community level to government and the parliament. It's about linking up the local decisions, decision making and local knowledge with policy makers and government. Let me give you another area where I think the voice can make an important practical difference. The Community Development Program or the CDP. CDP was designed in 2015. It was meant to be an employment and training scheme that also contributed to, contributed to remote communities. CDP supports around 40,000 people across 1,000 communities. In recent years, it's been a failure. It's been criticised for not being responsive to local communities and actually standing in the way of jobs and economic development. Because one size does not fit all. Simply, it simply didn't work across 1,000 communities. Residents of remote communities have told me they want skills to work as mechanics and to run the local butcher or the bakery. But despite asking for this, despite wanting to work to improve their community, governments have failed to listen. I believe The Voice can play a key role in helping to fix CDP. To ensure that it's fit for purpose, we know that listening works. We know it delivers practical outcomes. Let's take another example, birthing on country. Aboriginal community controlled health organisations have pioneered a more effective way of caring for mums and babies. One that embraces tradition and language so that mothers feel safe accessing medical services early and often. And by respecting and elevating the role of the extended family. Birthing on country is, uh, has proven absolutely that there has, there has been uh, a 50% cut in a 50% cut in babies being born early. Achieving this has been a real success. In the words of my friend Julian Lesser, the voice can help you us to understand better what's going on on the ground and help ensure that better policy is made that's more responsive to community. 
Or to put it another way, doctors get better outcomes when they listen to patients. Bosses get better outcomes when they listen to workers. Policy makers get better outcomes when they listen to First Nations community. Much has been made of the proactive representations the voice will make to Parliament and the government. Bring the priorities to local of local communities to Canberra will be incredibly important. So will be the request government, government makes to the voice. With this, everyone, will be a step change in our ability to deliver evidence-based policy. Policy that is supported by community and makes a practical difference. From day one, the voice will have a very full entry. I will ask the voice to consider four main priority areas, health, education, jobs and housing. The voice will be tasked with taking the long view. Unlike government, it will not be distracted by th three-year election cycles. It will plan for the next generation, not the next term. It will be focused on making a better future for the next generation. The time to make generational difference, everyone, is now. We live in an ageing country. Overall, less than a third of Australians are under 25. However, that rises to more than half for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In the decades ahead, the cost of, and the consequence of re repeating the same mistakes will be amplified. So, so too will the benefits if we listen and do things better. I want the voice to come up with fresh ideas, fresh ideas that can guide us over the long term. As the minister, when I meet for the first time with the voice, I will say, bring me your ideas on how we stop our people from taking their own lives. Bring me your ideas on how to help our kids go to school and thrive. Bring me your ideas on, we ha on how to make sure our mob live healthy, happy lives. How we ensure more people have jobs with independent independence and purpose, and with the independence and purpose that that brings. How we strengthen culture and language. How we, sort, we support our families better. How we keep alive. 65,000 years of culture and make it stronger. I'll be asking The Voice for their input to solve these most pressing issues. So there will be important work in The Voice's in-tray from day one. It's not going to be a passive advisory body. I want it to be active. I want it to be engaged. We need new perspective to all challenges, perspectives that are connected to communities. We need ideas that come from the people on the ground. We need a voice. As my trailblazing sister, June Oscar, puts it, an Indigenous body gives us an opportunity to elevate our voices in a country where we occupy a space on the fringe of government policy. A, go a voice gives us the ability to address parliament directly, directly through our connections to our communities and our regions. Now, I also want to say a few words about the No campaign. <laughs> the No campaign is being run by a group called Fair Australia. It is importing Trump-style politics to Australia. It is post-truth. And its aim is to polarise. Its aim is to sow division in our, in our society by making false claims 
including providing including that providing advice to government would somehow impact the fundamental democratic principle of one vote, one value, a claim designed to mislead. My social media, as you can imagine, attracts trolls who accuse me of things like trying to set up an apartheid state. Last month, Pauline Hanson went on radio and said that she had met a true black. To think that this is unimaginably um, insulting and de deserving of anything is really beyond the pale. Because what she was saying is that some Indigenous people are less deserving of our identity. To say it was, uh, uh, to say it was an insult is an un understatement. It was not called out by one media outfit. It was not written about by one media outfit. Do not let no campaign get away with using Trump-style politics in Australia. Do not let them divide us. Do not let them divide us. The pro proposed change is constitu constitutionally sound and legally safe. I know it doesn't suit the narrative of the No campaign, but the Solicitor General, who was appointed by the now Shadow Attorney General, has given clear advice that recognition through the voice is not just compatible with the system of representative uh, and responsible government, it will enhance it. The voice builds on well-established principles and practices and standards of accountability and transparency. It will help improve the quality of government spending, better programs and better outcomes. Friends, friends, voting yes at this referendum will we a vote to unify and strengthen Australia. Voting yes will be an act of patriotism, patriotism, an act of your belief in Australia. We are the greatest country in the world and we can be even greater if we recognise Indigenous Australians. One of the best things about a modern Australia is that so many of us welcome those who come from, from across the sea to make a new life here. I see it in my own multicultural community of Barton. We rightly take great pride in welcoming, welcoming waves of migration over the decades. And generation after generation of migrants have come to this country because they want a better life for themselves and their family. It is the great Australian story. But not everyone has enjoyed, enjoyed these same opportunities. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have not enjoyed those same opportunities. The gap is not closing. Disadvantage and discrimination persist. The good news is that later this year, we will all get the chance to do something better. Together, we can build a better future that recognises Indigenous, Indigenous Australians' rightful place in our country. A better future that genuinely listens to the needs and aspirations of Indigenous Australians. As the Prime Minister said at Gama last year, in years to come, we'll be able to measure the success of The Voice, not just by the number of people who vote for The Voice, but by the lives that The Voice helps to change, the communities in power, the opportunities it creates, the justice it delivers, 
the security it will bring to First Nations people around our country. Friends, history is calling us. And I hope more than anything that the answer is yes. Yes to the Uluru Statement from the heart. Yes to a voice in Parliament. And yes to a, to a better future. I want to conclude by quoting a passage from the Uluru Statement from the heart. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from our families at unprecedented rates. This, is, this cannot be because we have no love for them. Our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people to take a rightful place in our own country. When we have the power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and, they, their, and their culture will be a gift to this country. Friends, it is time. Nagali Yahagu, Baranjara, Manawal. Let's get this done together.